Good morning, welcome to mini lesson 10. This is gonna be kind of a short one because the math is easy and some of the manipulations we've already seen, but what we're gonna do is to develop uh, the grand partition function for fermions in the grand canonical ensemble. And from that, we're gonna build up what's called Fermi-Dirac statistics. So this is section 7.2 from Schroeder. So we looked at this table in the last set of lectures when we were just talking about how fermions can occupy a level, but ultimately this is all that we need to build the grand partition function. So we think about a level E sub s, and we ask what are the possible combinations of N sub s and E sub s that could be relevant for this level? So you could have no particles and therefore no energy, and then you could have, so that's an empty level, or you could have one fermion and then some energy value epsilon. Right? So this is it if you have a fermionic level. <clears throat> so we can take these values, n sub s and e sub s, and just plug them directly into the expression for the grand canonical partition function. This is called a Gibbs sum, I think. Um, so e sub s and n sub s taken from each of these columns of the table gives us a 1 for the empty level and an e to the minus beta epsilon minus chemical potential for the occupied level. And that's all. That's the grand partition function for any level occupied by fermions, which is really important because all the matter particles in the standard model are fermions. So that's really easy and I've, to me it has always felt really good to do that calculation because you get, you get so much so little work. So let's see what we can do with this now because it's, it's not exactly the same as the canonical partition function where in the canonical partition function uh, we really pushed on using that to do things like calculating average energy, calculating Helmholtz free energy and other thermodynamic quantities. The approach we take with the grand canonical partition function is a little bit different and it's hard to explain why in a simple way but we'll, as we go through the next set of mini lectures you'll probably start to see it. So here it is again, grand partition function for fermionic level. Um, we should note that it's the same as the one we got for adsorption when we did our little uh, viral spike calculation but it's a very different physical reason, right? In, in adsorption we were restricted to one adsorbate per site just due to the geometry that you couldn't fit more than one. Uh, but in this case, we're restricted to one fermion per level based on Pauli exclusion. And so the difference is one is real space geometry and the other is energy space occupation. So it's quite physically different. Be careful not to mix them up. Sometimes people do that. A lot of times you'll hear people talking about Pauli exclusion as though fermions can't be in the same physical location at, at one time. And that's true, probably, you know, but, but it's really not the key issue. The key issue is Pauli exclusion uh, is, is telling about occupation of quantum states in some kind of energy space. All right, <clears throat> so let's calculate some statistical properties. We can get the grand canonical probability from beautiful Z by taking the Gibbs factor in the top and dividing it by the grand, poten uh, sorry, the grand partition function. But what are we actually going to calculate from this? Let's see. It's actually not so straightforward. The straightforward thing to calculate is what is the average occupancy of an energy level? Okay. So in other words, the average number of fermions in the levels. So you can imagine taking that level and doing a series of measurements on it in time. Each time you measure it, it's either going to be a one or a zero. And then if you average over time, all those ones and zeros, what answer would you get? That's what we're asking. So the algebra is easy. We do 
uh, sum on the, the average number of particles is the sum on n sub s times the probability from the last slide. I factor the beautiful z, the 1 over z, out of the sum because it's just a number. In other words, it's already summed over s. And so for no occupancy, you get a 0. And for some occupancy, you get, for, for one occupancy, you get this factor, which we then simplify down to n bar equals 1 over e to the beta minus epsilon mu plus 1. And we call this a special, this is a really special quantity in quantum statistical mechanics. This is um, an, occup an occupation function. And we give it this special symbol, little n bar fd. Don't ask me why we switched to little n's, but that's the notation in the textbook. And this is called the Fermi-Dirac distribution, right? Very important. Um, if we were doing our class normally, this is one of the formula that I would ask you to memorize for the exam. That's not relevant anymore because we're not doing in-class exams, uh, but I'm just telling you so that you would know how important it is. Let's talk about some of its properties. So number one, the average occupancy of the level must be between zero and one, right? Hopefully that's obvious, right? The maximum it could ever be is one, uh, the minimum is zero, and so when you average up a bunch of ones and zeros, say over a sequence of measurements, it's always going to be between zero and one. And so that's just a, that's just again sort of poly exclusion rearing its head. But it turns out that that point number one tells us something special that n bar f d for fermions gives us already the probability of a particle occupying the level. So the average occupancy of the level for fermions is equal to the probability of occupying a level. And so you can show that by calculating this directly, right? So when you do this calculation, you should get n bar fd. So do that to practice working with these quantities, please. Um, you could even pause the video right now and do it. That might be a good, good use of your time. An important thing that I wanna say about this is this is specific to a fermionic level. It is not in general true that average occupancy is always probability of occupancy. That only works for fermion statistics. And so the other thing that we should keep in mind is that we have, as usual, this bridging function where we have microscopic quantities of uh, epsilon appearing in addition to macroscopic reservoir properties, the temperature, which is in beta, and the chemical potential mu. So we are in this picture where we have macroscopic and microscopic quantities interrelated. In this class, it's really important that you are able to analyze and understand graphs of the Fermi-Dirac distribution. Uh, I almost always ask something about this on exams. Um, so let's talk about some of the graphical properties of the Fermi-Dirac distribution. So the distribution in general looks a little bit like a step function, right? And so here I've plotted it for three different temperatures. It's always kind of a step. At very low temperature, so this is actually sort of near room temperature, it's a pretty sharp step. And as you increase the temperature, the step gets quite broad and smeared out. So for this particular plot, I've chosen a chemical potential of seven electron volts. You'll see why I chose that value in a, a little while, maybe next lecture. Um, but what we can do is see that the Fermi-Dirac distribution function is symmetric about the energy that's equal to the chemical potential mu. So that's this midpoint of the step right here, all right? And so it should be obvious by looking at the function when the energy equals mu, the average, uh, the average occupancy is exactly half. And, and so then in addition, if the energy is less than mu, the occupation quickly approaches one. When it's greater than mu, it quickly approaches zero. Again, how abrupt the step is, is determined by temperature. Oops, go back. And so this broadening out as you increase the temperature is called thermal smearing. 
And so these are conceptual ideas, I suppose, that um, that um, you should be familiar with and think through physically. So for example, why does increased temperature smear out the distribution function? So the basic idea is that at this um, below the chemical potential, states are states in this energy range are all occupied. Above the chemical potential, they're all unoccupied, right? And so what happens is, as you raise the temperature of the reservoir, energy transfer causes some of the states that used to be occupied at lower temperature, so here they're occupied, excites them above the chemical potential, right? So this little wedge in here, see that? Has been excited by energy transfer from the hot reservoir to be over here, right? So we take states that were occupied, transfer them above and make them unoccupied, and that reduces the occupation in the green curve here and increases it here when we're comparing the blue and the green curve. So make sure that you can talk that through and understand what I'm getting at there uh, and ask me questions during office hours uh, if it's not clear to you what's going on. So this is real, it turns out. So here I'm just showing uh, actually just a random Google search that I did. There are so many papers about this that it's hard to choose which is the best one. Uh, but this is this is a photoelectron spectroscopy study on the left here that compares some interesting uh, quasi-crystal alloys to just molybdenum metal. So I want us to just focus on the molybdenum metal because the alloy is sort of complicated. So these um, broken lines are molybdenum metal. And so if you measure photoelectron energy distribution from molybdenum at 30 Kelvin, you get this really sharp step. Um, energy reference sets the chemical potential to zero in this particular experiment. Um, and then when you increase the temperature up to 160 Kelvin down in panel C, you can see that the broken curve has been smeared out by a little bit, right? And so you really see these Fermi-Dirac distribution functions in real experiments pretty much all the time. <clears throat> and that's uh, really satisfying. And in fact, if you do see this, what you can do is use, use it as a thermometer in some cases. And we do this in our research group quite a bit, or at least we try to. Um, and another thing that you can do is if you know the temperature, you can, if, if you're sure you know the temperature, you can use the sharpness of the Fermi-Dirac distribution function to measure the energy resolution of your experimental apparatus. <clears throat> All right, so what does this prove? Fermi, Fermi Dirac distributions are real and electrons and metals are fermions, right? So this is just a really simple molybdenum metal, which is sort of this gray refractory metal. Uh, and we're gonna move on to that in, in about two mini lessons. But for now, we've pretty much done Fermi Dirac statistics. Um, so make sure you can do all the derivations in here. They're really straightforward and quick and make sure that you're able to think through some of the properties uh, of the Fermi-Dirac distribution function uh, graphically. That's really something that, that is a key takeaway from this class. So we'll see you next time.